Hello, this is Karen Launchbaugh. I'm at the University of Idaho and we're working on the Rangeland Principles class. And throughout this class we've talked a lot about what's happening above the ground and today we're going to delve a little bit deeper into what's below the ground and talk about some very basic principles of rangeland soils. I'm going to give you three or so definitions of what soil is. It sounds like pretty easy, like if someone came up to you on the street and said what are soils? you would know what it is, but it might be difficult to define. So one way to look at it is just from a strictly geological sense. And then it, throughout that definition, it would just be this loose surface of material on, this, on the surface of the earth that is disintegrated rocks that support plant life. What we might more traditionally think of as soil is just that material that nourishes and supports growing plants, especially as in croplands, etc. And it includes some rocks, water, snow, air, soil, there's a whole lot of things that are just inside of that soil, but mostly it um, supports plants. Another way to define soil is to think about its composition. How much of it is air, water, organic matter, or mineral matter? And when you think about those components, we are mostly interested in organic matter. It's a small part of the soil, but it's the one part that we as land managers can have an influence on. So how did soil get here? How was it made? There's four basic processes you need to keep in mind. The first is that soil may have come here from somewhere else. It may have been translocated. So translocation would be that movement of those soil particles. If it came to a site by wind, that's called LUS. Soils that are moved by wind are called LUS, L-O-E-S-S. -S. Soils that are moved by water are called alluvium. So alluvial fans are the soil that is at the bottom of a hillside that's been washed down, or there's alluvium right along streams and rivers also. So those are two ways that we get soil movement from one site to another. Another thing that can happen is just transformation of that parent material that's in place. So the rocks that are on a site can be turned into soil, into that looser, more mix of organic matter and air and minerals through chemical and physical properties. It could be chemical properties like changes in uh, acidity. It could also be physical properties like uh, the freezing and thawing. That's transformation of bedrock into soil. Next, there could be additions, especially organic matter. When uh, worms or animals or roots go into the soil, they add organic matter. That changes the soil. It could also be inter inorganic particles. It could be things like fertilizer, but it could also be animal dung or urine that adds inorganic materials to the soil. Uh, finally, we have losses of the soil, removal of particles completely from the soil to another site. That's what we call erosion. Erosion is that detachment and transport and redistribution of soil. So it's movement of soil from one place to another. Erosion then occurs by three different processes. It can occur by water, wind, or gravity. That wind or that movement of lustful soils happens when the wind comes up and there's not enough vegetation to hold it down. So that was the source of a lot of the problems in the dark days that were seen during the Dust Bowl in the 30s. Uh, it can also occur today when we don't have enough vegetation on the soil to hold the, that soil to the ground. Water, of course, happens in um, large rainstorms. Uh, again, if you've got vegetation on the soil, you can reduce that amount of erosion. It can be very severe in croplands, especially those that aren't, uh, are in fallow. And then finally, gravity can move soil. Uh, we call that mass wasting, especially we just see it when, when a whole uh, profile of soil will just move down a hillside by gravity. And the traditional way that we think of the forces that affect those processes are that we have this acronym CLORPT, climate, organic matter, relief, parent material, time. These are the five forces that create soils, CLORP. We're gonna go through those one at a time, just give you a sense of what each one of those is. Climate. Well, of course, climate is uh, things like temperature and precipitation. Precipitation has an effect on soil because it can change acidity. It can cause leaching where nutrients or um, inorganic uh, materials are washed down through the soil. It affects the nutrient content, content, especially nitrogen and clay content. Temperature can have an effect on soil because it can increase leaching, especially of bases like calcium, molybdenum, sodium, potassium. And uh, it also can decrease the formation of nitrogen in the soil, and it also affects organic matter. So both, um, maybe the take home message is temperatures 
and precipitation both can change the organic and the inorganic nature of soils. Okay, the second factor that we're going to talk about is organisms. They're really important. Remember, a productive soil is a living soil. You've got to have living organisms to make really productive soil. One of the most important things that organisms do to the soil is they fix nitrogen. Remember, nitrogen in the air is in that N2 form, and the process of fixation is where nitrogen N2 is turned into ammonia in H3. So ammonia is useful to plants. It's an inorganic form of, of um, nitrogen that can be used by plants and other organisms in the soil. And um, plants like legumes are ones that have this microbial relationship. Uh, uh, they have this relationship with microbes on their roots and they create these nodules and that those nodules and those microbes are able to take N2, turn it into NH3. So it's a really important process. The, um, other way that it's done in agriculture is that we humans we fix nitrogen in the form of um, chemical or of um, fertilizers. So we do it with a, a manufacturing approach. Other things that organisms do in the soils they affect decomposition. They mix the soil the, through roots and through um, worms and other insects in the soil. They mix and aerate the soil. They can, of course, remove nutrients. Plants are removing nutrients from the soil, and they can change or um, transform nutrients. And then finally, organic matter is really important in soil for holding moisture. Talk about relief then, topography. Where, why does it matter where the soil is on the landscape? It's important because it affects the accumulation of soil. Things like alluvial fans that we'll talk about later is where water has washed soil, and it kind of forms at the bottom of hills. And it also affects the amount of water that enters the soil, especially through um, the um, in, in impenetrable layers. So, for example, um, the amount of water that's available to plants is affected by topography. So here is a plant that's very happy on the left because it's got lots of roots before it hits this impenetrable layer. And then um, as you get further and further up, there's less and less of that a really crumbly soil that's available for the plant to grow in. And then when you get less than 10 inches, we would call that a, a shallow soil because there just isn't enough of the real soil material before you hit bedrock or before you hit an impenetrable layer. So that's one way that topography affects the ability to grow plants. So now let's talk about parent material. Parent material is, is where the soil, the crumbly parts of the soil actually came from. So it's kind of the geology or the, um, the bedrock part of the equation. It affects the texture of the soil, how much is sand, silt, or clay. It also affects the mineral nature of the soil. Depending on what type of parent material you have, it will determine how many nutrients are available in the soil. Okay, sand, silt, and clay, we mentioned that a little bit, but sand, silt, and clay are types of texture. Sand, of course, is like sand on the beach, very large. Uh, silt is um, quite small. It's that flowery um, feeling of soil. And then clay is very small. These, it's important to determine the amounts of sand, silt, and clay in the soil because they affect the drainage, the water holding capacity, and the aeration of soil. For example, clay soils have lots of water holding capacity, but not much drainage or aeration, whereas sandy soils have lots of drainage, but not much water holding capacity. Um, it also affects how susceptible to erosion a soil is, how clumped together it is. Sand is one a, a very large particle. It's hard to, um, to move by wind or water. If we know the amount of sand, silt, and clay in the soil, we can classify it. We can put different amounts of sand, silt, and clay together to create classifications of soil that act similarly. And we do that with the soil texture triangle. You've probably seen this before. And you'll see that there might be clay soils or silt soils or sand soils on the corners of that triangle. And in the middle, we have all these mixtures, clay loam, sandy clay loam. A loam is a mixture of soil particles. So in the middle of that triangle, we have mixtures and these types of soils, these classifications of soils tell us information about how much infiltration there is, how uh, easy it will be for animals or plants to live on that soil, how much water it will hold, how much water will go through it. Those soil textures also can be um, 
affecting the soil in the way that it has structure. So whether it's granular or it's platy, where it looks like sort of one layer on top of another, or it might, might be angular or blocky. Um, it also might be prismatic. Sometimes you have soils that look like they've got little prisms or columns. And sometimes you just have sort of wedges, soils that just kind of fit together like a piece. All of these sorts of structures are created by the bedrock type or the parent material of the soil and then the soil texture. Color is very apparent when you look at soil. We've got, we can have soils that are very red, like in the um, Australian outback. We can have very deep, rich soils, mala soils that we might find in the cornfields of Iowa and Illinois. White soils are really clumpy soils. All of those um, colors indicate different types of soil. They indicate the certain sort of physical and chemical characteristics of soil. And then due to the humus or the amount of organic matter, that could also change the soil. And iron is another important factor that changes soil. So here are some of the things that we know just that about how the iron characteristics could change the soil. If you have a gray soil, that might mean that you have a soil that has a lot of ferric oxide in it. Um, I'm sorry, ferrous oxide, ferrous oxide, F, uh, Fe2O3, that, that makes the soil very red. We often see red soils. Other times we might see yellow soils, especially if they've been, um, if we've had them underwater, we might see a lot of yellow soil. So just um, the very important colors of soil just created just by um, iron, uh, forms, different forms of iron. The last one is time. You can't have soil without just lots and lots of time occurring. So in order, once all of these um, factors come together, then as the soil ages or just sits in place, then um, there's changes in the soil and that's what creates what we see as that whole prism of soil with topsoil, subsoil. So soil develops over time. You, you might have in a soil pet on, which is just sort of one unit of soil, one column of soil. The top, you might have a very organic level or not, depending on what the climate is. Then the A horizon is that topsoil. B horizon is a subsoil. And then if you go down, you also get a level of subsoil, which would C horizon, which would be more rocky. So on the left, you see those three horizons laid out. And on the right hand side, that's what they look like. O at the top, very black and organic. And then as you go down, you see more and more rocks. So soil develops over time. That didn't happen in a few days. It takes thousands of years to create that, that beautiful soil pet on that we see when we dig down. Okay, the bottom line is when you get climate organisms, relief, parent material, and time, and you create soil, all of those things affect the type of vegetation that's on the site. So a good soil scientist is also a good botanist. They know the plants and plant communities because that reflects what soil is under the plants. And now we have soil maps, but many of those were initially based on just plants because um, depending on what plant is there, that will tell you what kind of soil is below the surface. So some of the most important um, soil types that we have on rangelands, I'm just going to focus on those. Uh, but we're going to focus on just three soil orders. So soil orders are big um, orders of soil that are, that are very um, similar on very broad scale. So first, mollusols. Mollusols are the green on this map, right down the middle of the plains where we had lots of grasslands. We have a lot of mollusols because grasses are really important for creating mollusols. The roots that move down into the soil create that dark, rich, soft form that we think of as mollusols. Also in the west, we have in the, um, in the central Oregon and Washington and a little bit into Idaho, we have a big group of, of mollusols. Many times we see these beautiful soils, these big, rich mollusols in ecosystems that are now been, have been turned into farmland because they were really great for farming. Eritosols are also common rangeland soils. They're the kind of uh, light uh, peachy color on this map, and they are um, dry soils, arid. It's, they're from arid lands. So there's not a lot of organic matter. In them. They're often rocky, and they can also have salts that accumulate on the top because there's not enough moisture to pull that salt down through the soil. So eritosols are kind of blocky, not very well developed soils. The last group of soil that's very common on rangelands is um, entosols. Entosols are this light blue color here. You'll see them throughout the plains and throughout sort of the Rocky Mountain uh, eras, or areas. Um, they, they are soils that are kind of 
not real blocky because of their parent material they're rather undefined would be the best way to think of endosols is they're just just kind of undefined as you go down and you see them very much through the Great Basin a mix of aridosols and entosols. It's very nice to know the soil orders and the general characteristics of a soil order but that's not useful for management. On management we would make a map or we'd go to web soil survey extract a map and it would have uh, these uh, different colors like on this map here on the screen that reflect the soil series, the groups of soils that have similar textures and profiles. And then what is actually mapped is what is called a soil map unit. Okay, it'd be cool if we could map just individual soils, but soils occur from inch to inch and foot to foot. So on a management scale, we just couldn't manage with soils that are so um, finely defined. So what happens is there are groups of soils that occur together they are often have similar geomorphology. They're, they're similar in texture and type, and they they occur together. So we look for those soils that are commonly occurring together, and the soil scientists have mapped them. They put them into groups. So what a soil map unit then is is a group of soils, and that's what is actually on the soil map. Soil maps um, are important because um, soil affects the type of plants that grow on the land and therefore soil maps are really this, the source from which we make basic uh, decisions. And I'm going to bring in another concept. If, if, the, if the, an individual soil map unit has a very kind of specific type of plants and that's important for management, we would call those that group of plants an ecological site. So the actual management that we do on rangelands is usually on an ecological site basis, and let's talk a little more about that. Ecological sites um, are based on this fact that soils affect plant type, and an ecological site is defined as a distinctive kind of land producing a distinctive kind and amount of vegetation. So we start with soil maps, we look at the plants they um, create, and then we can look at the different communities of plants across an ecosystem. And in this picture, you can see in the foreground, there's this sagebrush ecosystem. A little further down, we've got some juniper moving in. That might be a different soil type. In the base, down in the alluvial part where the, the river is flowing through, that's yet a different kind of soil. And then behind, at the very back, is this really rocky, steep ecological site. All of those four different sites have a capacity to have a distinctive kind of vegetation, which means they're distinctive ecological sites. Okay, so let's look at ecological sites a little bit more clearly. They are recognizable land type. They have a specific physical characteristic. We can see them on the ground, such as soil, climate, hydrology, geology, topography. There, there's a specific type of physical characteristics that they have. They also create a distinctive kind and amount of vegetation because of those physical characteristics. And then finally, they respond similarly to management actions or natural disturbances. So that's why they're important in management, because if we do, uh, if, if we do something like graze or mow or burn uh, on a piece of land, be that whole, if it's on an ecological site, that whole piece of land has the same capacity to respond to what we're doing. Or if a fire comes through, uh, then that piece of ground, that ecological site, it has the same kind of capacity to respond from the fire. So our management actions and what might happen on the ground is determined by what ecological site that occurs on. Okay, here's an example. They may vary in the kind and amount of vegetation. In this picture, you've got these really clay type of badland soils in the background. If we graze those, they're going to be affected differently than this um, terrace that's above the stream. That flat area, that's going to, the fire is going to affect that soil differently. Um, the grazing will be more a uh, different effect on it. And then when you get down into that stream, which is kind of incised down, there's a different kind of vegetation there also and then on the bench land and then up by the road here, there's a different kind of vegetation. So all of those are different ecological sites. They all have a different ability to respond to grazing practices or to natural disturbances like fire or flood or drought. Here's another one. This one is from the, um, the Bruno Canyon in the Wahis, and you can see up on the top here, right near the foot of the camera is some uh, low sage, and then it gets really rocky and you get these just um, nearly vertical uh, rocky points that um, 
uh, have very little soil on them, and that would be a different ecological site. And then down at the base of the canyon where the river grows through, uh, you see a nice green area there that has greater capacity because it's deeper soil and there's some moisture there. So that's three different ecological sites. Here's one more example. Uh, at the front, right where we're at, we've got a, sort of a sagebrushy site and then there's a, a, a river flowing through and then there's some cows back there that are in this this nice soil that probably has is very productive it's probably very deep because over the years there's been uh, soil particles and organic matter that have been washed and into that floodplain above the, the that floodplain where the cows are is another sagebrush site I'm probably pretty dry there uh, kind of rocky but some soil has come off of the hill above it and then as we're going up in elevation, we might be getting just a little bit more moisture. And then at the top are where those trees are. So that's a different ecological site because it has some different physiological characteristics. That's a good example of basically three different sites. Okay, finally, one more. Uh, down along a creek here, we have a, a floodplain, an active floodplain. That's one site because it's got soil coming in and it's a very dynamic in nature because that, that creek is moving back and forth. Above that is some sagebrush right um, as you get up above the floodplain onto the terrace. And then above that tall sagebrush is some sor shorter sagebrushes on the uplands that are, um, they're not affected by the, the, by the water. So they're a different ecological site altogether. Okay, remember then you've got a specific physical characteristics of the soil of that ecological site. And that tells you what the potential of the soil is. What does it have the potential to grow based on its soil and its climate, etc. And that ecological potential is seen in the form of a distinctive kind and amount of vegetation. So if you hear that term ecological potential, that's what it's about. An individual ecological site has an ecological potential based on its physical characteristics. And what we see is that distinct and kind and amount of vegetation which reflects the ecological potential. The other important part of an ecological site is that response to management actions and disturbances. That is described as ecosystem dynamics. So when you take an ecology class, they're going to talk about ecosystem dynamics. Yeah, ecosystems change from time to time depending on the disturbance and or depending on our management actions. Ecological sites have similar responses to management actions and disturbances. So they have a similar ecosystem dynamic. So that's just a little bit about what's happening below the soil. Um, as we move into management actions, I'm thinking about rangeland principles. Remember this concept of ecological site and then the soil map units, which that's based on.